All right, so let's go in the opposite direction. Um, so we're assuming now, well, first of all, the fact that T is self-adjoint is assumed from the very beginning, right? So that's part of our assumption. Then we're assuming that all the uh, eigenvalues are positive or non-negative. Okay, uh, but when an operator is self-adjoint, it's going to be self-adjoint on a space V that I don't know if it's real or complex, right? Uh, but if V is real, being self-adjoint on a real inner product space implies the existence of the orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. Okay, what if V is complex? On a complex inner product space, uh, the existence of the orthonormal basis of eigenvectors was equivalent to T being normal, right? But being self-adjoint is stronger than normal, so being self-adjoint automatically implies that is normal. And the conclusion is the same, right? Even if the space is complex, I still uh, know that there exists an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. So basically, if T is self-adjoint, it doesn't matter if you're dealing with a real or a complex inner product space. The conclusion is the same. It has to be diagonalizable either way. Okay, right, um, beta is V1 through Vn. The orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. Uh, what are we trying to show here? We want to prove that T is positive. Well, I assume that all the eigenvalues are positive. Therefore, we want to show that T is positive definite, right? That is, we want to look at the inner product be between T of x and x, where x is some vector in V. Um, since x is some vector in V, then it must look like that, sum of a i v i i equals 1 to n. All right. So then T of x is T of that sum, but because T is linear, Um, is the sum of a i times t of the i. Okay, but v i's, uh, all those vectors are eigenvectors, right, for t, because that's what beta was, a basis of eigenvectors. So each t of v i is, in fact, the lambda i v i, where lambda i is the corresponding eigenvalue. All right, so going back here, I need the inner product between T of X and X. And that will be the inner product between the sum of AI lambda I VI, that is T of X, and X, which is the sum, let's use another index like J, J equals 1 to N, AJ, VJ. Um, so you can pull out both both sums. A i and lambda i, you can just pull them out of the inner product. A j goes out in complex conjugate from the second entry. Writing smaller and smaller. Right? 
AI, lambda I, AJ, complex conjugate, times the inner product between VI and VJ. Uh, but beta was orthonormal, right? So the inner product between V i and V j uh, is zero unless i and j are equal, right? So t of x inner product with x is in fact the sum. Um, I have one index left because the other one would have to equal it. So it's going to be a i lambda i a i complex conjugate inner product between vi and vi, again, orthonormal basis, that's the norm of vi squared, which is 1. So sum i equals 1 to n. Absolute value of a i squared times lambda i. All right. We assumed that all the eigenvalues of t are positive, right? So strictly greater than zero. So this sum, uh, since each of this is strictly positive, the square of a number is greater than or equal than zero. This sum theoretically is greater than or equal than zero, but we need it to be strictly positive because I want it I want it to be positive definite, not positive semi-definite. So when is it zero in fact? Well, in order for that sum to be zero, I would need all those coefficients to be zero. There is not possible any other way. And if each coefficient is zero, then that means x itself will have to be zero. So it's strictly positive for all non-zero vectors x. Uh, so t is positive definite. OK, um, where would the change be if I'm assuming instead of positive? Let me use another color. non-negative, right? So I'm allowing the lambdas to be zero. Well, it will all be the same up to this point here, where lambdas will be allowed to be zero. And if lambdas would be allowed to be zero, then the entire sum is allowed to be zero. So t is positive semi-definite in conclusion. All right, so this is the main uh, property. Uh, just one more idea I want to put here about the, um, um, the connection between positive definite and invertibility. A matrix A is positive definite, not semi-definite, but definite, and A is invertible. Uh, why is that? Um, well, positive positive definite implies that A is self-adjoint. So uh, you know all the real eigenvalues, the characteristic polynomial splitting. So f of t is in fact uh, like this. And it's also the determinant of A minus T identity, right? Identity and when. Um, remember that F of 0, if you look at the, the actual definition of the characteristic polynomial, F of 0 is just the determinant of A. 
So a being invertible um, is equivalent to f of 0 not being equal to 0. All right, but if I look at the first way in which we wrote the polynomial, then what is f of 0? If you plug in 0 for, uh, for t, uh, you just get negative 1 to the n times the product of all the eigenvalues. OK. Uh, the matrix is positive definite, so what does it mean about the eigenvalues? They are real and strictly positive numbers. They are not allowed to be 0. So none of this is 0. So there is no way out of the product to get the number 0. Therefore, the matrix is invertible. Make sense? If it's positive semi-definite, I cannot conclude the same thing. right? In fact, invertibility is equivalent to not having 0 as an eigenvalue. So it's more general than this. If 0 shows up between the eigenvalues, just according to this, then the matrix is not invertible in your value. OK, so uh, I wanted to have this discussion about positive definite and uh, semi-definite now. They will show up later in 6.7. So we wanted, I wanted to just have some idea about all this before that section. All right. Uh, 6, 5, uh, unitary and orthogonal operators. So here's the definition that the book gives. You have a linear operator on a finite dimensional inner product space again with the property that it preserves the norm in this sense, that the norm of t of x equals the norm of x for every vector x, then t is called unitary operator if it's a complex space and orthogonal operator if it's a real space. So they have two notions for the same idea uh, depending on the space um, it, it's uh, acting on. Um, I might call it uh, something else. <laughs> No, neither one. Uh, I usually call this an isometry. So in general, in operator theory, um, it, it preserves the norm. It's just called um, Anyways, isometry would mean both of them. But uh, just sticking to the uh, language of the book, uh, unitary on a complex space, orthogonal on a real space means the same thing. Um, now, how can you have an operator that is preserving distances, if you want, if you want to think about it like this, or preserving the length? Uh, well, one way to have that is if, you, if, if the operator is just taking the vector into something of norm 1 times the vector. Right? So you're just kind of rotation. If you think about rotations and stuff, those would preserve distances. Um, there is an example in the book. Uh, with uh, this idea of you know multiplication by something of norm one, only that it's it's represented in a stranger space, a space of functions, uh, with an inner product given by an integral and so on. So you can take a look um, into that. So for example, uh, the vector space is given by continuous functions on 0 to pi. Uh, with the inner product given by 1 over 2 pi integral from 0 to 2 pi f times g bar. And uh, they consider a function h in v. Such that every element in the image 
of h, which is a complex number, right? Every, every element in the image is a complex number, but they all have absolute value 1. So they, they just take this function, which could very well be, um, you know, constant equal to negative 1 or any, um, pretty much any complex number of length of magnitude 1. And define t from v to v, t of a function is h times that function. Right? So exactly what I was saying. You just transform each element into the element times some, something of, of length 1. Um, then we're all over a complex space, so this will be called a unitary operator. All right, so we just have to look at the norm of T of F squared. Well, the norm of T of F, but I'll make it squared in order to be able to represent it as an inner product. T of F is H times F. Um, so know that this is multiplication, it's not function composition or anything, so we'll just multiply them. So 1 over 2 pi, integral from 0 to 2 pi, uh, the first argument here is h of t times f of t. And the second one will be h of t complex conjugate times f of t complex conjugate uh, dt. Um, but because h was assumed to be something of absolute value 1, then that product will be 1. Uh, so after all, you get 1 over 2 pi integral 0 to 2 pi, uh, f times f bar, and that is just the norm of f uh, squared. Right, so you're not changing the, the length by multiplying by um, a function of module 1. But this type of example, again, could show up in any kind of setting with, with its own inner product. So the idea will be the same. OK. So what this theorem says and actually, I don't need this part here. It's not necessary for the proof. And let me call this D. It says that, so you have a linear operator on a finite dimensional inner product space, which could be real or complex. But anyways, the following are equivalent. And they are all equivalent to part D, which D defines unitary or orthogonal operator. Okay, so T is uh, unitary or orthogonal if and only if, look at part A, that would be the nicest, um, the, the nicest and most useful thing, uh, thing that can be used to check that something is unitary. So that says that T is more than normal, right? Normal means T, T star equals T star T. But this one says that they, they both equal the identity operator, right? So a bit stronger than being normal. But to get, so this equivalence between A and B is the one that we care about, and that's the most useful thing. But to get from one to the other, we have to go through B and C. That's how the proof will go. So we'll show that A um, implies B, implies C, implies D, and D implies A, to make them all equivalent. A implies B. So A implies B, um, I need to look at the inner product between T of X and T of Y, for two vectors X and Y. 
I'm going to move the T from the first entry into the second. So is the inner product between x and t star t of y. Um, however, the assumption of part A is that t star t is the identity operator. Identity applied to y is just y. So we're done. C implies C. Uh, C says that if beta is an orthonormal basis for V, then T of beta is an orthonormal basis. So let beta uh, be an orthonormal basis for V. T of beta, then, we need to show that T of beta is also an orthonormal basis. So T of beta is the following set. T of V1, T of V2, T of Vn. And I'm just going to look at the inner product between two of these vectors. Arbitrary. So the inner product between T of Vi and T of Vj. Well, according to part B, the inner product between T of Vi and T of Vj is the inner product between Vi and Vz. Um, but since beta is orthonormal, the inner product between Vi and uh, Vj is what? One or zero, right? Depending on, so that's the Kronecker symbol, so delta Ij. any i and j between 1 and n. So we're done. So it is an orthogonal set of vectors. Each, each vector has norm 1. Uh, there are n of them. Orthogonal means linearly independent. So n independent vectors will form a basis. If beta is an orthonormal basis. Or b. Okay, uh, C implies D. We want to show the main thing, the definition of the uh, isometry, the unitary thing. So the norm of T of X equals the norm of X for the vector X. So let uh, beta be an orthonormal basis again. Such a thing exists, right? Because V is a finite dimensional in our product space. So let beta be an orthonormal basis and let X be an element of V. Uh, let's say it is the sum of AI, uh, VI. So I want to show that highlighted thing. So I'm interested in the norm of X. I'll look at the norm of X, but I'll make it square. So norm of x squared, inner product between x and itself. Uh, so the inner product between the sum of ai vi and the sum aj vj. Uh, do the same as before, pull out both sums. AI goes from the first entry out. AJ goes in complex conjugate, right? AI, AJ bar, inner product between VI and VJ. Uh, beta was an orthonormal basis again, so VI inner product with VJ is delta IJ. I'm only keeping one index.
So in the end, uh, the norm of x squared is the sum of the absolute value of a i squared. All right, so this needs to equal norm of p of x, everything squared. So let's look into that. That's the inner product between t of x and itself. Okay, uh, t of x is sum. This is x. T was linear, so t of x is the sum of a i, t of the i. And the other t, t of x, I'm going to use a different index, the sum a j, t of a j. and get the sum of a i a j conjugate inner product between t of the i and t of the j all right but according to part c uh, if beta is an orthonormal basis then t of beta is an orthonormal basis so this inner product here is again delta ij so i'm keeping one index out of the few let's say sum i equals one to n ai ai complex conjugate and that takes us back to the same sum as above so the norm of x squared So they've all been uh, quite straightforward, right? A implies B implies C implies D. The most complicated part of this proof will be that D implies A. D implies A, we're assuming the definition of the uh, unitary um, operator and we want to show that it's normal and that T T star equals the identity. Okay, I'm going to need a lemma, which I'm not going to prove here. I'll prove after we're done with this. The lemma says the following thing. If U is a linear operator on a finite dimensional inner product space V, it is self-adjoint. And it has the property that the inner product between x and u of x is 0 for every x in v. Then u is the 0 operator. So u, I think we call that t sub 0, right? The operator that sends everything into the 0 vector. So I'm not going to prove it now. We'll prove it afterwards. Um, let's let's use it. Or D implies A. Um, okay. So the norm of X squared is X inner product with X. And it also equals the norm of t of x squared by assumption, which is t of x inner product with t of x. Right? Because that was our assumption, the norm of x equals the norm of t of x. Um, I'll replace this last one by the inner product between x and t star t of x. 
So now I'll take those two, subtract one from the other. So x inner product with x minus t star t of x is 0. What's on the in the second entry could be replaced by this. Identity minus t star t all applied to x, right? That's the second entry. If I call this operator u, I get into a situation like in the lemma above. Because this says that the inner product between x and u of x is 0. That's exactly what the lemma was requesting. But also, um, the operator u had to be uh, self-adjoint, right, in order for, for the lemma to work. So let's check that. What is u star? Uh, the adjoint distributes right over addition and scalar multiplication. So it's the, it's the adjoint of the identity, and that we know is the identity. And then, when you had a, um, when you had, um, a composition right, between two transformations, like u, uh, t and u, let's say, the adjoint of t u is the adjoint of u composed with the adjoint of t. It goes backwards, like with the, taking the inverse, let's say. So it's going to be this one first with the adjoint, right? And then the adjoint of the first one, which is like double adjoint. Um, but in the end, it's still t star t. <clears throat> So identity minus t star t, and that is u. So u equals u star. Um, it is self-adjoint, and it has that property. So again, I'm allowed to use this lemma here. So using the lemma, this u is the zero transformation. So t star t is just the identity operator, if you add to both sides. All right, uh, that's only part of what we need, right? Uh, t star t is the identity. We had to show this. So we want to show that also t t star is the identity. And uh, this argument will not work anymore uh, because how can I get t t star in that order out of such a thing? I can't. I can't really create that. Um, but the the good thing is that is not necessary. Uh, here is the um, here is a very short and good argument for showing that the other one is also true. Um, I'm going to go to the matrices associated to T uh, in, a, in an orthonormal basis. So let's just say beta is an orthonormal basis. For B. And let A be the matrix of P in the basis beta. All right, so I'm going to start from here. This is the one that we have. Identity equals t star t. Take the matrices associated to both sides in the basis beta. The matrix associated to a composition is just the product of the matrices. And because beta is orthonormal, I'm allowed to pull the star out. 
Okay, the matrix of the identity as well. The identity operator has the identity matrix as uh, its associated matrix. So identity n by n equals, we call this matrix A, right? So equals A star A. So now if you think in terms of undergraduate matrix theory, that just means that A is invertible, right? And A star is its inverse. As long as it right, exists a matrix, it doesn't have to be both sides with an invertibility. One side is enough. All right, but if A star is, is its inverse, then it is also true when I multiply it to the right by A star. It's still A times A inverse, so it's still the identity. So now I'm going to build back two operators. So the matrix of T in the basis beta times the matrix of T in the basis beta adjoint is the matrix of the identity in the basis beta. Beta is orthonormal, so put the adjoint back in. Make the composition again. So the matrix of T T star and the matrix of the identity operator are the same in a basis beta. And that again, that argument we've seen before, this will imply that the two um, operators must be the same. So that is uh, exactly what we need. So what do we um, keep from this? Again, I would say the equivalence between A and D. That would be, uh, and actually A is what is useful most of the time as a description of unitary transformations or matrices. Okay, so um, being unitary or orthogonal is a little bit more than being normal, right? If it's more than being normal, uh, that means it should mean something on top of the existence of that orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, right? There should exist uh, the orthonormal basis, but something on top of that should happen because this is more than being normal. And here's what the connection is, corollary one. Um, if T is a linear operator on a complex finite dimensional inner product space, uh, on complex we call them unitary, so T is unitary. If and only if, because it's normal, it must have, uh, V must have an uh, orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. Uh, but because it's more than normal, uh, those eigenvectors will correspond to eigenvalues of absolute value 1. Pretty much being unitary means that all the eigenvalues mu must have absolute value one. So if you have, if you're given an operator with an eigenvalue that is not one in absolute value, then it has no chance of being unitary or orthogonal. Okay.
Okay, so let's assume that P is unitary. According to the previous theorem that says P is normal in particular. And then using the previous section, normal on a complex inner product space is equivalent to the existence of that basis beta. Uh, so all it's left to do is to show that all the eigenvalues must have absolute value 1. So let lambda be an eigenvalue for t. Uh, again, uh, from the theorem above, because it's unitary, it is the corresponding eigenvector the corresponding eigenvector. Um, so according to the previous theorem, the norm of T of V is the norm of V, right? No, actually not according to the previous theorem, just according to the definition of unitary operators. So since those norms are equal, uh, V is the eigenvector, so T of V is lambda V. So the norm of lambda V is the norm of V. But lambda is a scalar, so it could, could be pulled out of the norm. It goes out in absolute value. And V, remember, is an eigenvector, so it cannot be zero. So it must be the case uh, that the eigenvalue has absolute value one. Uh, so that's for a complex space. Uh, if the space is real, I'm going to replace unitary by what they call orthogonal, right? And um, yeah, let, let me rewrite it, but I don't think I'm going to go through the proof again. It's very, very similar. Uh, so let T from V to V be linear, where V this time is a real in our product space. And, well, on a real inner product space, uh, the existence of the basis of eigenvalues, uh, of eigenvectors, is equivalent to, to T being self-adjoint, right? And orthogonal and self-adjoint, or unitary, whatever you call it, and self-adjoint, don't, don't really agree, right? So th that has to be assumed. T is self-adjoint. And um, not unitary, but now it's called orthogonal. If and only if V has an orthonormal basis. Of eigenvectors. Corresponding again to eigenvalues of so absolute value one. Okay, so the proof will be very similar to that one, so I'm not going to um, go in that direction again. All right, so in terms of uh, exercises in this section, uh, most of them will build, will build on that theorem with the four equivalent conditions. So for example, number three says, prove that the composition of unitary operators is unitary. Okay. And T.
are unitary if the space is complex or orthogonal if the space is real. And the composite operator you compose with T is also unitary or orthogonal depending on the space. So you pretty much have two options here. You either, either go to the definition, right, or go to one of the properties in that theorem, like t t star equals t star t equals identity. Um, I think either one would work in this case. Uh, if I go to the definition of being unitary, I just need this. Being unitary or orthogonal. It's the composition, right? So that thing is u, the norm of u of t of x. Uh, but u is unitary, so it preserves distances, right, or, or lengths. So u of something has the same norm as that something. This is the same as the norm of t of x. And because t is unitary, the norm of t of x is the same as the norm of x. So it just goes straight forward from the definition. You could have also uh, gone to, um, you could have also used that property with t t star equals identity, but I don't think it's necessary here. Okay. One. Uh, orthogonal projections and the spectral theorem. So I'll definitely not finish this one, uh, but uh, I will assign homework for next uh, Monday. Uh, the homework will be on, so it will not be on 6.6, .6, right? It will be on 6.5, I think, and 6.4, previous two sections. Uh, so let's start, uh, start talking about this. We'll probably talk about so before we build on the spectral theorem, we need to uh, talk about this notion of an orthogonal projection. So we'll start with the projection, first of all, and go there. Uh, so let uh, W, we're going back to external those direct sums, uh, W1 uh, direct sum with W2. Uh, just remember what this means. It meant two things, right? Uh, W1 and W2 had to have trivial zero intersection. They were both subspaces, so they both contain at least zero. And also, uh, any vector x in V, uh, in W, can be written as the sum between a vector in W1 and a vector in W2. Right, that was the definition from a while ago. So we're going to define next uh, the projection on W1 along W2. is going to be from W to W 
defined by t of x, x being an element of w, can be written like this, right? x1 plus x2. t of x equals x1. Whenever x equals x1 plus x2, x1 in w1, x2 in w2. All right, so basically out of the sum between x1 and x2, you just keep the first one from w1, you just forget about the second one, and that way you project it onto the first space. Um, easy example to think of, again, think of R3, x, y plane, sum with the, with the z-axis, take a vector, right? It has a projection on the x, y plane, and that, that's what the projection on the first space would be. Okay. One remark before uh, we move to orthogonal projections. T is a projection if and only if T equals T squared, where T squared is the composition between T and itself. Why? Well, if T is a projection, it actually means it's a projection on some W1 along some W2, uh, you know, from the setting above. That's what the projection means. Then t of an element x of the form x1 plus x2 would just be x1, right? So then what is t squared of x? Or t of t of x? Well, if t of x is x1, uh, t of t of x is t of x1, right? So what is t of x1? x1, because x1 is already in w1, so when you express it as a sum between something in w1 and w2, it's just x1 plus 0. So you just take the part from w1, which is itself. So t equals t squared. Backwards. Well, backwards is not that um, that easy. Uh, why not? Well, when I'm trying to show that an operator is a projection, I have to come up with the entire setting, right? I have to come up with a W1, a W2, in order for that T to be a projection on W1 along W2, right? So it's, it's a bit more work involved here. So here it is. And that setting you might have seen before. I think there were some homework problems related to this a while ago. Uh, you write as x as t of x plus x minus t of x. t of x is something in the range of t. This element is something in the null space of t. Why is that? Because when I apply t to that difference, first of all, t is linear, and then minus t of t of x, so minus t squared of x. But look at my assumption t equals t squared, so this is 0. So every element of v uh, can be written as a sum between something in the range of t and something in the null space of t. 
Uh, now, in order to make this setting work, I need this to happen. So I need the intersection between the range and the null space of t to be 0 only. Let x be a vector in the intersection. Uh, well, being in the null space, p of x must be 0. And being in the range, it means that x equals some t of y. They both need to happen at the same time. All right, but if you apply t to both sides here, t of x is t of t of y. And t of t of y is t squared of y. Look here. t squared is just t. t squared of y is t of y. And t of y is x. Right? But t of x is what? Zero. Because x was in the null space. So x must be 0, therefore the intersection is trivial in the sense that it contains 0 only. OK, so we got our setting. Uh, we split the space V into um, a sum, right, a direct sum between two things. Uh, so now let's just uh, try to show that T is a projection on R of T along N of T. This would be W1. And this would be W2. So then <coughs> we need T to be a projection on W1, so on the range. along W2. So what does that mean? Let x be a vector in V. How do you write x as a sum between something in W1 and something in W2? We have it right here. So in order for t to be a projection on w1, it means that when you apply t to x, what should you get? Just the part from w1. What's the part from w1? This. So it's automatically satisfied by the way in which this has been set up. So t has to be a projection on w1 along w2. Okay. All right, so we keep in mind that projection is equivalent to uh, t being equal to t squared. All right, we need orthogonal projections, which will be more than projections. So we start with a projection. We're going to call it orthogonal projection. If on top of being a projection, those two things hold. The orthogonal complement of the range of T is the null space of T, and the orthogonal complement of the null space of T is the range of T. Uh, 
Um, all right, so what does this mean? So projection meant t equals t squared, right? Let's see what having those two strange things on top of that would actually imply about t. I don't know why I moved this one. And this is what that will mean. is an orthogonal projection if and only if not only that t equals t squared but t is also self-adjoint. And the example that I uh, was talking about before uh, with the sum between the xy plane and the y plane, that projection of a vector in, into the xy plane, that, that's actually going to be an orthogonal kind of projection because imagine how things are perpendicular to each other there. So um, let's see why things hold like this in general. Let's assume that T is an orthogonal projection. Well, in particular, it is a projection. And being a projection, this has to hold t equals t squared, all right? So it's only about what happens uh, with the adjoint, right? So we need to, to show that the adjoint must be uh, t itself. Uh, just to remind you how we constructed the adjoint, uh, the adjoint was that operator with the property that the inner product between t of x and y is the inner product between x and t star of y. And that operator was unique, right? That's how we constructed t star. Uh, so this we know. Um, but what we'll show here is that the inner product between t of x and y is the inner product between x and t of y. Because of the uniqueness, t will be the adjoint of itself. So t equals t star, right? Again, provided that we can show this. Does it make sense, the setting? I don't have a question. This is the definition or the theorem that defines the adjoint, right? The adjoint is that unique operator that has this property here, the first one. Okay. And we'll show the second one because the operator is unique. The adjoint must be t itself. So let x and y be two vectors in t. And y. Um, v which as before, we write like this, because t is a projection, right? So it's going to be a projection on to the range along the null space. Um, and remember that we have this additional things here, because t is in fact an orthogonal projection. We know more about this setting. So let's say that x is x1 plus x2, and y is y1 plus y2 in this setting. So let's look at the inner product between t of x and y first. All right, so I'm trying to show this thing here. Inner product between t of x and y. Well, what is t of x? It is the projection onto the first space. So t of x is x1. And y is y1 plus y2.
Okay. With this. Um, X1 is in the range, Y2 is in the null space, right? In the second entry of the sum. Uh, the reason I'm looking at this is because I know that the orthogonal complement, for instance, of the null space is the range. So the inner product between something in the range and something in the null space will be zero. Here I have something in the range and something in the null space, so this will be zero. So the inner product between t of x and y is the inner product between x1 and y1. Let's go to the other one. The right-hand side was the inner product between x and t of y. So x is x1 plus x2. What is t of y? There's the projection on the first space, so t of y is y1. Say it again. So now I realize that uh, I don't think I proved that lemma from the previous theorem. Uh, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to go back to the previous section for that. It's, it's not a big deal. It's just a couple lines, but I could completely forgot about it. All right, so it's x1, y1, plus x2, y2. Uh, x2 is where? x2 is in the second space, so in the null space. y1 is in the range. Again, the orthogonal complement of the range is the null space, so the inner product is zero. This disappears, second one disappears, and you end up with the same thing as above. So we're done, right? According to this argument here above, t will equal t star. What happened here? I didn't do that, did I? <laughs> I do have an undo button, it works. Okay. All right, so this is one implication. Let's do uh, this backwards as well. So backwards, uh, we're assuming that t equals t star equals t squared, and we want to show that it is an orthogonal projection. So t is a projection anyways, uh, because t equals t squared, right? Uh, so what else do we need? Um, we need, on top of being a projection, we need those two underlines, underlying things. So we need that the orthogonal complements work nicely. Uh, so show. Uh, that the um, orthogonal complement of the null space is the range. And that the orthogonal complement of the range is the null space. Now, uh, when you look at those two identities, it, it might look like one of them, or the second one, let's say, would follow from the first by taking the you know, orthogonal complement on both sides of the second. Of, the, of this first identity, you get the orthogonal complement of the range on the right, but on the left you get the double orthogonal complement of n of t. Um, and that, I don't know if you remember, we had a homework question back in that section, which said that the double orthogonal complement gives you back the original space, provided that the space is finite dimensional. Otherwise, you had to construct a counterexample. It was a homework problem back then. 
So if the space is finite dimensional, those two identities that we have here, I mean, one, they're one and the same. But in general, on a non-finite dimension, on an infinite dimensional space, they are different. So that's why they, they list both in the definition. All right, so let's show this one first. Now, how do I show that the orthogonal complement of a set is another? I show that the inner product between two elements of the one in the first set, one in the second, is zero. Well, let x be an element of the range. Uh, if I do it this way, I'm actually showing this, right? I'm doing double inclusion here. Uh, so I start with an element in the range, and I want to show it's in the space on the on the left. So I need that the inner product between x and anything in the null space is zero, right? To show that it belongs to the orthogonal complement of the uh, null space. All right, so let's see what's uh, going on with those vectors here. Because x is in the range, then x is f of some f. There is no f. C of some vector z. Okay, uh, and y is in the y is in the null space. Sorry, so look at the inner product between x and y. We have z and y. Um, remember that y is in the null space, so I would like to move a t on top of the y to make it t of y, so to make it zero, right? And that's how I would get zero. Uh, but I have t here, so if I move it into the second, it becomes t star, not what I want. However, um, my assumption is this one, right? That t equals t star, so I can just go ahead and replace t of z by t star of z. And then move t star into the second argument as a t. And again, y is in the null space of t of y is 0. So the inner product between x and y is 0, so we're done. Let's go backwards, backwards in this sense. Uh, so let, I'm not going to go anywhere. Probably I should just stop here. It's going to take a while. Um, so I'll just leave it in the open like this in the middle of the middle. We will not we would not finish this anyways today. So. Um, so we'll continue on Monday with this. So again there will be homework. I, I didn't get a chance to grade your previous homework, but it will be graded by Monday for sure. So I'll post the homework. Um, I can't promise I'll do it tonight, but tomorrow by noon it should be posted.